Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming here this evening. Two photographers this evening uh, who are going to talk to you. Um, two photographers who, in the discussion that we've had in the run-up to this, um, a long part of that discussion was actually defining their work and how they see themselves now. We've agreed on photographer for the time being, um, but there's a awful lot more to it than that. Can I introduce Balash Gadi and uh, Teruko Oyama, um, both international award-winning photographers who spent a great deal of time working in war zones. In fact, uh, they've spent a lot of their time working on what is known as the Central Front in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, between them, they've spent the better part of the last eight years uh, covering wars. Their style is uncompromising. Uh, their search is for the truth. And I'm sure we're in for a very interesting evening. Um, Balash, first of all, uh, this business about how you define yourselves. Uh, we were talking earlier about you started off as press photographers. What are you now? Are you, are you photographers, documentary photographers? How do you see yourselves? I try to simplify this thing and I call myself a photographer because eventually I'm taking pictures and that's my responsibility. Um, whatever drives me, um, you know, that's the, that's the bottom line. So if you call me photographer, I'm happy with that title. He's very modest, isn't he, Tara? Both Not of you usually. won so many awards. Uh, you know, you've won categories in the World Press Photo Award uh, at least twice, uh, and, and you two have won many awards. What, what is the essence of your work, do you think? Uh, I don't know. I didn't even start as a press photographer. I started as a backpacker, so... Um, <laughs> Eventually, I, I became a photographer. I'm not sure what kind, and uh, I think I had a very ambivalent uh, relationship and feeling about journalism over the years. But increasingly, over the years, that's been the focus, or that's uh, started to feel more important to me. Uh, even though probably my the way I photograph is pretty atypical uh, of press photographers. Well, perhaps it might. Uh, we've got three films to show you this evening of, of their work. And perhaps let's start with, um, first of all, Balash's work. You were embedded with uh, various military units, with Americans, Canadians, and British soldiers. Yeah, the piece uh, you're going to see is um, what I photographed in 2007, where you know half of my year I spent in Afghanistan with various units, as Tim said and um, you know, uh, Hungarian troops. Uh, but what, what you're going to see is mostly, uh, it starts with uh, Canadian troops in Kandahar, British troops in Helmand, and then it goes to a military operation uh, conducted by US forces in the eastern front line of Afghanistan. Um, so that's. So I should point out, the reason I was asked to come and moderate here this evening is that Balash and I had our first experience of war together eight years ago. We found ourselves as a group, a group of independent journalists crossing the river from Tajikistan into northern Afghanistan. Really had no idea what to expect. Um, I decided that discretion was the better part of valor and didn't do too much of it afterwards. But you stuck at it, and both of you. And we'll see the evidence and, uh, of an extraordinary career soon.
tell all the elders here something. Every airplane that flies in the sky belongs to me. Every sensor I have in the mountains belongs to me. I have sensors in the mountains, hundreds of them in the mountains, and I have them in the valleys. And I have unlimited aircraft and gas to put in them and bombs to put on them. As far as the Korngal Valley and the whole history and everything behind it, it's rather unique. It's, a, it's about a, a populace that's been uh, shunned and just continually uh, pushed uh, with their backs up against the wall. They were pushed out of Nuristan because they were, um, they were taken, I guess, their religious beliefs and becoming deeply Wahhabist. They pushed them down in the Korngal Valley, down in here into the Kunar province. And ever since they've been down here, uh, the only real cash crop that they've had has been the lumber uh, that's up in the hills. So the lumber trade is almost like the opium trade down in the south. What's happened is, is that when the Americans came in here, we came in here so hard because we were getting so much insurgent activity growing on in here that when we came in here, we came in here really hard. And I liken it to the LAPD going into Compton or any one of the, the gang districts in Los Angeles. The people, they don't like it when you come in there hard and you're kicking in doors and you're accusing everybody of being bad, but when you don't know anymore, you automatically just start doing that. And so the people have essentially turned against us. We're going down there to like the nexus of where everything meets and then enters into the Korngal Valley. The soldiers are going to have to make some hard decisions. Hey, you know, do I end up shooting into that home? Do I end up dropping a, a bomb on that home because I'm taking some fire from there? Or do I end up trying to push myself and my men into that home and, and kill them, you know, with, with my weapon systems that I have here so that I don't have too much collateral damage?
I think you'll agree there were some extraordinarily powerful images there. <coughs> and typical of your signature, I suppose, that they were so atmospheric, um, <coughs> black and white images, and that use of sound. Uh, was so, You recorded that yourself, didn't you? Yeah, I recorded the sound. I think um, with, with the new media and with the internet, we have, um, we have this very powerful tool. We can add more layers into photography and just you know, use these tools to explain um, you know, more in a more in-depth way what, what the story is to give, you know, create atmosphere that, that we would like to create and uh, probably it's just a much more effective tool nowadays um, to, to add these additional layers to photography. Liberating in some ways? I mean, um, I would say it's a very interesting approach and, um, and I think we are just in the very beginning of of finding out how to how to go forward and how to use these these new tools, but I think um, it's um, yeah it's liberating in many ways. Because we've heard that you know so many photographers, particularly freelance photographers in the past, have complained that their work hasn't been used to a greater or, or a lesser extent that, that they they're not able to use some of their best material. Now the internet allows you to do that. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's there to uh, to put every kind of work there, and I think. You know, there is no real reason why we should limit publication into the into the shrinking market of, of magazines and newspapers, and and also you know that most of the work is normally filtered through editors, and and I think you know there is a much more diverse work out there that uh, that must be seen, and I think internet is a great tool to to put this work out. It's a very personal experience going through something like that, isn't it? And and so is it important to you that you're able to express? those feelings and, and how it was for you at that time through your photography? It's definitely a very personal uh, thing and, and also I think the one of the reasons why I'm, why I'm doing it is I think photography, I'm using photography as an, as an excuse to go into situations because I'm curious and I want to experience those situations. You know, I, you know amongst many things I'm, I'm very curious about you know, what war is about for for both sides, for the soldiers and for people who are suffering because of the causes, um, I think the only way to to honestly uh, see, report about it, and first of all learn about it, is to experience it firsthand. Well, there was a couple of images there that um, well won you major awards. Um, that last image in particular uh, of the of the man holding his child in his arms, and that's uh, for you. That's quite a a controversial image, and we'll come back to the reasons for that later in, in, in our discussion. Um, Taro, let's turn to you and, and, and your work. That's um, Balash's work there was with troops. He was embedded as a photographer, working alongside them. Uh, what we're about to see from you now is work that you, was shot as a unilateral, if you like, outside the direct control or influence of, of the military. Um, uh, what would you like to say about that? Well, quite a bit of it was. Uh, some of it was also done uh, during embeds. Uh, I think basically, you know, the concept of unilateral embedding, it's, <coughs> it's, it's been controversial sometimes, and I think a lot of it's overblown. I think as photographers, journalists, explorers, whatever, we use whatever means are, ne are necessary and available to us. So um, there are places that we want to go to and we want to see. If, if there's a military ride in there, then we'll take it. Generally speaking, I think both of us would prefer not to be attached to men with guns when we're traveling through places, but we do it both ways. And um, I think in many ways, we've we followed the same path and the same approach. Um, we actually, we both worked on these uh, pieces together. So in a way, we cut them both so they wouldn't be redundant. So. Uh, you know, Balazs certainly hasn't worked in Afghanistan only as a as an embedded photographer. So, uh, <coughs> but uh, in this next piece, you see a little bit more of the civilian side of life, and that's an important theme in your work. And let's let's have a look at that now. Sorry, you have to bear. This project is an exploration of a space that sits in the middle of nowhere into the center of everything. On a world map, it spills across Afghanistan and parts of Pakistan, from the border of Iran to the line of control in Kashmir, down to the unrecognized and unpacified nation of Pashtunistan. 
to the east is China, to the south India, to the west and the north all of the oil, the Persian Gulf and the Caspian Sea. Within this territory live the Hazar, the Tajik, the Balti, the Kyrgyz, the Waki and the Patan. Only a few of the tribes and clans that live in the shadows of the Hindu Kush. Over the centuries, one empire after another has been buried here. The British, the Russians, before them Genghis Khan and Alexander the Great. And now America's caught in the quicksand as well. Across this terrain, I've made portraits of the people and the spaces I've encountered. The common thread that connects them is their isolation, their endurance, and their shared experience of weathering cycles of disaster, both natural and man-made. Extraordinary images there. The, 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 the hallmark for both of your work seems to be you get so much atmosphere in, into your pictures. You, you, we, we were talking earlier, you say you're not so concerned about the technical side of photography. It's the images, everything for you, and particularly, particularly conveying that, uh, that atmosphere out of, the, out of the occasion. And yet what, 
you, you keep going back to dangerous situations, you keep going back to war zones. When does it become enough? I might have had enough. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm taking the next year out. So, um, but uh, well, I what's mean, kept you going back and back and back again and again over these years? I think still trying to understand, still trying to learn, still so many places out there that um, that I haven't been that <coughs> I'm curious about. So many mountain ranges and valleys that are just complete unknowns. Um, I think over the past few years, we've covered a lot of military operations, and it's not because either of us have any aspirations of being war photographers or any particular interest in war. It's just that that's become um, a defining characteristic of the region, and it's um, we've become interested in understanding the mechanics and the strategy behind one of the major players out there. So that's become a huge part of um, what's kept us going. Balash, is it, is it possible to become addicted to this? I don't think it's possible to be addicted to war, although, although I guess many people say that. I mean, I didn't experience it myself. Um, to be honest, war is a very, very unpleasant thing. Um, and I don't think normally people get addicted to that. But I think, you know, it keeps us going back because as Teru said, there's, there's a lot to discover. There is a lot of puzzles I'm missing uh, that would help me to understand, like, why is it happening? Um, because I want to move on to, to a concern of yours. Uh, it, and that is that possibly you think that some, some of what has been reported so far isn't really getting to the truth of what's actually happening out there on the central front. Is that another reason why you wanted to keep going back? Because you feel, you know, there, there is more to be said about this. And, and, and viewers, listeners, readers are not getting the full picture. Um, yeah, this is the feedback from viewers. Uh, before we came here, a couple of days ago, we went to Jersey and we, uh, we opened the Amnesty International uh, Film Festival with an exhibition uh, titled Battle Space that contains uh, often graphic images about the realities of war. Um, and you know, we selected uh, more than 20 photographers <coughs> work just to show what we think real about war and what is not necessarily the image, what, what the viewers can access for various reasons. Um, and I think um, we, can, we can basically show this piece, which is the last piece for you, and uh, if we're shifting to that topic, I think uh, this is something you should see. That's a multimedia piece uh, and interviews about this exhibition and about this work. OK. Um, hopefully, that's going to be. Some of these are photos that we couldn't publish, that we weren't allowed to publish, uh, that if we did publish, we would get kicked out of embeds by the military. But on Battle Space, we can publish the photos as we want, as we want them to be seen, as they were originally shot. And I think that's what's so important about this space. TV, the last thing people are getting is reality. And the show's about the real. The men, women, children that live in a world that most of society have no clue about. It's not their fault. It's the fault, it's the fault of the media. Somewhere along the line, someone said that we need to be protected from the truth. And that's what this show's about. It's about the truth. It's important for the media to step up and, and show the truth, show us the reality of what's going on over there. It's not just an insult to the masses by denying us visually what's going on, but 
also everyone that either chooses or is forced to live in the battle space. The, the moving picture just passes by, but the photograph forces people to stop and look. Well, for instance, the napalm girl changed the face of war and forced people to stand up and stop the senseless brutality that was going on at that time. People got involved during Vietnam because they could see what was going on. Today, we just, we just hear it. We hear of an explosion that killed 34 people, but we see pop culture Scarlet's mugshots after their DUIs. We hear that things are getting worse, but forget about it with the next image of the American Idol winner. As a veteran, it's important for people to see this, for me, because a vet doesn't come home from war. We just come back. And battle space shows people why. Today in Iraq, there are so many things that we can't photograph anymore. Uh, car bombings and suicide bombings are now off limits. It's actually illegal to photograph those scenes. We can't photograph wounded soldiers without their consent. We can't photograph dead soldiers, coffins of dead soldiers. A few years ago, the army used to invite us to photograph the memorials. Every time a soldier was killed, there'd be a memorial, and they would invite us to photograph this. Now, those are off limits also. We can't photograph those memorials at all. We can't photograph battle damage vehicles. We can't photograph hospitals. Morgues are off limits now. So pretty much everything that gives evidence that there's a war going on is almost impossible to photograph. You can still get photos, but you've got to work around the edges, and sometimes it takes weeks to get an image that a few years ago you could have gotten in a day or two. So it's just gotten so much more difficult to work. The Center for Research did a study of major U.S. papers and magazines over one six-month period. There was not a single photo of a U.S. combat casualty during that time. As the number of dead soldiers reached the 4,000 mark, surveys showed that the American people had no idea how many soldiers had been killed. Uh, I was speaking to one magazine editor and she said that people don't want to see it. They've done the polling on this and their readers don't want to see the war anymore. Uh, and she also said that advertisers, frankly, don't want to see pictures of Iraq in the magazine. They're tired of it and they think it doesn't go well with the type of advertising that they want to do. Uh, so there's many different angles. It's, there's no one person or one entity to blame. I think the photographers are trying to get their pictures out and I think battle space is, is evidence of that. I think it shows the effort that we're trying to make. But um, it's extremely difficult to get the space in the publications these days. When the soldiers are wounded, the U.S. government immediately says, well, we can't let you take these photos of the wounded soldiers because it, you know, we're, we're respecting the soldiers' privacy. But this is the most important historical event of our generation. This is not a private event. We have invaded a country. There's a war going on that involves 29 million Iraqis and several hundred thousand Americans. You can't suddenly say this is a private event. It's a bit absurd. At the same time, you can no longer photograph Iraqi detainees. So we're in a situation where the U.S. government has been accused by almost every nation in the world of torturing detainees at Guantanamo and other places. But if you want to take a picture of a detainee, the government says that you can't do that because the government wants to protect those detainees' privacy.
few people know, but the U.S. military has a very sophisticated internet operation, and they know where the soldiers in the units are from, and they get in touch with the hometown newspapers and the hometown radio stations and TV stations. They're constantly offering free content. Increasingly, this is what people see. There's fewer and fewer photographers, photojournalists, and so newspapers are beginning to pick up a lot of this footage that comes from the U.S. Army, basically. And I think more and more... Uh, the U.S. Army is taking control of the narrative of these wars that are going on and really controlling the public images of, of what's happening. And I'd like to think that Battle Space is, is a pushback against that. I should say that uh, that exhibition, Battle Space, has been online for a little while now, and it's been shown. It's currently been shown uh, in Jersey um, at the Amnesty International event there. It's been shown in New York. What kind of reaction have you had to this exhibition and to those images? Every single time we've shown it, it's been the response has been consistent. A lot of people come to us and say, "I had no idea." that this was happening, no idea that it looked like this. I've never seen pictures like this, to which our response has been, how is that possible? You know, it's been eight years. It's been eight years your country's <coughs> been at war. How, do you, how have you never seen a picture like that? And, you know, that's a question the, the media community's got to ask itself. It's not that you haven't tried to sell those images to publications or to magazines. I mean, what sort of response have you had when you've, when you've presented work like that to, to editors and, and picture editors? I think the first hurdles comes when we would like to take these images because, you know, obviously the, uh, the various armies would like to uh, project a certain image. And, um, it, you know, the process is very difficult for us to actually go and, and reach the point when we can photograph these images. And you would think that you know, once it's done, you're over, and then you know you have green light, and you can publish these images. But then the second hurdle comes from the media itself, uh, for various reasons. It's self-restricting itself, or you know, they just they just not really publishing most of these images. Either they are through graphic, or they just they just not really um, going out. I think this selection, very very few of them was published, and I think most of them have a very well-deserved place in the media. And is that why you felt strongly enough to want to put this with, with your colleagues to put this exhibition together? Because you it felt started you a bit as an accident. That. I had a yeah. friend with a gallery in New York and she asked me to curate an exhibition. <coughs> we just spent a year in Afghanistan just in and out, mostly embedded uh, and up against one wall with the military trying to get into these situations to see what was really happening and with a lot of effort actually getting to getting a piece of it and then bringing those pictures back or sending them out and finding that the magazines that we worked with <laughs> didn't want to publish them. And there's the basic response which you hear a lot and it's an age-old thing. It's this idea of some suburban family that is eating their breakfast and does not want to be disturbed with a picture of what war looks like. So what you end up with in magazines and newspapers is a lot of pictures of a very sanitized looking war maybe a war where occasionally people get shot, but not in some really nasty, catastrophic way, not in some event where their legs are blown off. Um, and it's not a very honest portrayal of war. Also, on this event, a couple of days ago in Jersey, you know, one of these men, one of these reader, actually asked us, like, how, how could he get more access to these images? How come that you know, he's not receiving that from the media, and he was asking us what would he do and what would be the best way to, to reach those images, and frankly, I couldn't, you know, give a proper answer to him. Um, I guess, you know, you should, you should just vote with your money and, you know, stop buying newspapers that, that are not serving you well, probably. And yet the interesting thing is we're, we're, we're covering, <clears throat> you're talking about wars where it, they're largely being very unpopular with populations here and, and in America, 
across Europe. People have railed, they've demonstrated uh, against the war. So is it really necessary, given that, that the pressure has been on governments to withdraw, uh, certainly from Iraq, uh, to show them the horror of what has been going on there in such graphic detail? I don't think it's as simple as, you know, uh, portraying an anti-war message, because I think this term anti-war is totally meaningless. I mean, I don't know anybody who's more anti-war than a soldier who's done three 16-month tours, or his mother, or his wife, or his family, or her husband, or et cetera. And I'm not a pacifist. I'm, I'm not calling for any troop withdrawals anywhere. But I think we need to be honest about how things get conducted. I think we need to be clear about what works, what doesn't work, what's counterproductive, what's ugly and nasty and messy, and how we can do this better. I think that's the best thing we can do <clears throat> for ourselves, for our soldiers, for the people whose countries we occupy. Do you think this is a, a, a Western European trait that in some parts of the world, in Russia, for instance, on the evening news, it's not uncommon to see you know, body parts and the full horror of what's actually taken place in a suicide bombing and so on. Uh, is, is, is this how you see it? We recently returned uh, from a trip uh, from Pakistan where we spent a month. And you know, it was shocking watching the news and find the same same way the, uh, their media and their army handle the situation. Um, even they use the same words. So you would think that culturally it's a very different place. And you know, it's just the same recipe. And probably it's happening for the same purpose. Just you know, show the message and broadcast the message that they have the interest to to show to the public. And um, you know. So what you're feeling is that what the editors in general are being too compliant. They're they're, they're too willing to 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 self-regulate, to sanitize war in effect, and, and not to get to the to the grit of what's really going on. Sure. I mean, I don't pin it on our, our editors. I don't know anybody's more frustrated than, than the editors that we work with directly. And, and they're in a particularly bad situation because they end up being the apologists for this completely dysfunctional system. But um, yeah, the, the institutions of the media, you know, the military term for it, I think, would be dereliction of duty. So we haven't done our job. And, and so who are you pointing the finger at? Us collectively. I mean, I think on an individual level, we all try. We try. I think uh, you know some of the editors that we work with try. But I see a lot happening, you know, on a personal level in the offices that I walk into. And the same thing when I'm on a military base. There's something that that soldiers call the CYAMO, which is cover your ass. Basically, you know, you ask a captain why you're doing this. Does this make any sense? And he says. I know. I don't know. You know, he's doing his job. He needs to get through the day. He wants to get his troops home alive, and beyond that, he wants to become a major. And you see the same thing in any office you're in. You know, people just need want to make it through the day. They don't want to get fired. You know, especially now, most of the media institutions that we know are in survival mode. So, people are even less interested in rocking the boat than they might have been 10 years ago. I know that you've both got an issue with some of your images having been manipulated or used in a way that you were not happy with. Um, there is one picture in particular, isn't it, Balash, uh, that you'd like to talk about? I think you saw this picture two or three times today, and I think it's, it's something that, um, <coughs> that I was really frustrated about, because um, most of the time, my work is exclusively uh, uh, is exclusively financed myself. I, I dedicate my time and uh, all my efforts to show something that is very important to me. And then you know I'm I'm really uh, eager to publish it. Is there any other way to show an image? And then, and then once your image is getting published, then you provide all the information about the image itself. I mean, at this time, I was really shocked, you know, how <coughs> this image was published. And I just want you to, um, to 
to read the caption. Is that uh, is that the right size to read the caption? Yeah. Probably for the front oh, row, okay. but can we see it at the back? <clears throat> First of all, perhaps it might be worth just looking at the image again and uh, to help you make your point. In the, in we were discussing this earlier. And Balash asked me, what did I think was going on in that picture? If you just spin <coughs> down, I'll take it down a bit and you'll see the, no, the, the picture uh -huh. itself. That was the picture you took. What actually happened in, when this... When you and what actually happened is that during a military operation, um, the US Army went to, um, to move into a village that was a very hostile village, and then they intercepted radio conversations from insurgents, and they, they decided to, to basically blow up a house. And the next day when we moved into the village, we found um, dead bodies on display, and uh, five, five civilians were killed, and uh, probably seven or more uh, people were injured. Uh, this man is holding a kid who was um, injured from shrapnel. And, um, and uh, just tell us about the, the caption. What is that? Well, I think everyone can guess. But I mean, I would like to ask the audience, what would you think when you read this caption and when you see the image? Obviously, it's a suicide. Bombing. Probably we would think that uh, you know, they they were wounded from a, from an Afghan suicide bomber. Just, just for you, some of those who may not be able to read the writing here, the caption actually says, looking at that image, the number of suicide bombings in Afghanistan in 2007 has surpassed that of the past five years combined. So um, obviously it made me uh, very upset, and I repeatedly asked the editors to uh, to correct their mistakes and I think two weeks later I got the first editorial response saying that um, we, we all the wrongly applied uh, but we don't necessarily think that you know it, it should be corrected and I just went over and over insisting and then finally they um, you know the magazine decided to publish like a short note but they refused to put uh, this word editorial due to editorial error they just mentioned that uh, you know, the caption did my image wrongly applied. Um, you could tell you it was your mistake, possibly. I, that's, that's how I would read it, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, basically I just, as a personal photographer, I just decided not to work ever again with this news magazine. And uh, unfortunately, I think that case is pretty unique, because, you know, everyone afraid that, you know, they're going to lose their job. We are all depend, and probably, you know, it's, it's kind of a chain of dependence where actually prevents us to be honest and prevents us to, to be thanked to, uh, to the readers. And I think, you know, that's just definitely not the way to go. Tara, do, just to continue this theme, do, do you feel the coverage of what's been happening in, in Afghanistan, Iraq in particular, has it really got to the heart of the story from your point of view? Has it, has it really shown the public what's actually going on? Well, I have a pretty frequent experience of picking up a newspaper and reading an article. And even when I don't think that, the, that, that there's factual errors, a lot of times I'll look at something and say, well, yeah, that's true. And you know what? You could have published this article three years ago because all of this has been completely obvious for a long, long time. And people have been telling you these things. but somehow it wasn't interesting enough for you to report on. And, and regarding Afghanistan and Pakistan, I mean, I really wonder if Barack Obama hadn't kind of turned the, the tables a little bit and, and, and identified that region as the central front on the war on terror. Would the media have decided that it was uh, suddenly interesting again? If you, John you, McCain became president instead, would we still be considering Iraq the central front? You have both recently returned from the Swat Valley in Pakistan. Um, where we've been told there's been a major campaign that's been going on involving the Pakistani army against the Taliban. Uh, what's your, what's your, you, you, were, you were there, so what's your uh, reading of, of the coverage and, and, and what we've been told? Yeah, I'd like to correct you. We were in Pakistan and we, we were very eager to see what's going on, although 
you know, with, with other media outlets, we were just basically blocked totally out, and uh, there was no way to go into the SWAT and report on the military operations. But frankly, what was very disturbing and very frustrating to uh, to listen to the news and you know just read newspapers where journalists deliberately quoted and you know without questioning those numbers that came up uh, and mostly you know said by by a military spokesman and. I think the numbers were just extreme, and every second day there was another 200,000 refugees. But you know, if you go out and see the refugee camps, you know, you see like maximum 100,000 refugees, and they're talking about now I think two, two and a half million refugees, and no one really asked the question. Uh, but where those refugees are when it goes to a military operation, when when the army is conducting this brave operation, when. 1,400 Taliban killed. No one questions, like, what's the proof? Not even the army provides us images. And you know, frankly, turning on any kind of, you know, leading news channels on the TV, you saw their, their presenters announcing these numbers and reporting from these events as predicting that they were actually there and they, they saw and they asked the questions. And that's just simply not true. You mean the people, the journalists, are, are too quick to believe what they're told, what the, the information they're, they're receiving from official lines? Is that what you're saying? That they're not inquiring enough, they're not challenging enough, they're not going to do what generations of journalists have done before, and that's to go and find out? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Well, we saw they're not even asking the most basic questions. People not asking the most basic questions? Yeah. Oh, oh, what sitting of? there at the press conference when, when the Pakistani general says, we've killed 1,400 Taliban soldiers. And you say, where are the bodies, you know? Show us some evidence. Were they really Taliban soldiers? Were they civilians, maybe? Who, you know? Is this because reporters, you know, professionals who are, who are trying their best, possibly, to, to do the best job they can under difficult circumstances are, are, are playing this cat and mouse game with press offices, with government officials? I think who, as these questions, I mean, it's nothing hard about it. I, I don't see any circumstances that would prevent you to go to a press conference in Islamabad and ask these questions. You know, I'm not blaming the journalists not taking the risk to go to the front line, which, by the way, even if they, you know, wanted to go, was impossible. But I think these are, like, very simple questions, and, you know, you cannot really um, justify not asking those questions with the financial crisis or with the lack of resources the media outlets has. I mean, there will be those who will say, look, dozens of journalists have been killed. Friends of ours, people we know personally, have been killed trying to get to the truth, trying to do what journalists have done, you know, uh, for generations. And that is to seek out the information, to try to, 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 to get the tru truth. Are you implying there's something rotten there, that, you know, that, uh, that those lives have been lost in vain because... Our friends have died too, and you know, yours too, and please tell me they didn't die for what we see on TV, because that's bullshit. You feel strongly about that? You think that what, you're being, what we're being shown on television is not, as two eyewitnesses, an accurate account Quite of a lot what's of taking it is bullshit, place? Yeah. So who do you blame for that? I blame... I mean, there's a lot of blame to go around, you know. I, I blame... I think you have to start. You have to start close to home, and you start with us. Start with us as a profession. We didn't. We didn't. As a profession, we haven't asked tough questions. We haven't fought hard enough. We haven't pushed hard enough. You know, we've taken no for an answer way too many times. The the media has gone to an. Ex I mean, the military has gone to an extent to manage the perception of the conduct of war that has been totally counterproductive, not only for our countries but for them too. Because ultimately, it's them. It's their guys who are out there sucking it up. And the public, of course, is also equally to blame. You know, the other day at Jersey, you know, this guy asked, you know, what do we do? He said, well, you know, people will sell you anything that you will buy. You keep buying it, they'll keep selling it. I think this is a very good time to open up to questions. <clears throat> because I'm sure that there are questions that will have arisen out of the comments that we just made. Who wants to start? This lady, here. could you just take the microphone? I should say that this is being webcast, so if you, we'll bring the microphone to you. Hello, my name, 
My name is Susan Glenn, formerly of The Independent on Sunday Review, and I'd like to comment on what you were saying about editors and um, the, the process of material getting into the magazines. Um, in the 15-year period that I was a picture editor, um, I can definitely say that um, when I was first working on the magazine, um, there were far more I mean, there was far more coverage of the Balkans um, wars, for example. And within the last five years, it's, it's definitely tailed off. And uh, what you, you, you were suggesting is absolutely true. You know, the advertisers, the editors, and the managing editors all um, are definitely uh, not interested in getting this kind of material into the, into the papers. Um, but what I would say is that I congratulate you in, in what you've been doing and the, 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 the way you've been taking the um, ball in your own court and, and, and doing something about it and displaying the pictures the way you want them to display them, which I think is, is a great advantage from your point of view. You get to show the material the way you want it to be seen and with a, an authenticity as well, and in particular your your piece with the, with the audio um, really sort of worked well with the pictures and gave it a, a kind of um, um, a, a sense of the truth being told. And uh, it frustrates me because I grew up in the 60s and I certainly remember the Vietnam War being, being covered. And you know, here, here we are, as you say, eight years in. Who would have believed that this country is at war? You just don't get a sense of it. And um, it frustrates me enormously. Um, in the particular paper that I was working for, I really felt that it was the, uh, the editors in chief that took the direction or, or took the decisions not to have uh, picture stories in, in our supplement um, that covered Iraq and um, uh, Afghanistan, and that frustrated me enormously. Did you fight battles over that? Absolutely, yes. But you lost. Abs yes, we d yes, we did. Um, and the excuse that we, that we were given in particular was that um, the, they, there was a lot of coverage in the daily paper. And so the, 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 the weekend magazines were to counterbalance uh, the heavy <coughs> content in the, in the week. But I didn't feel that was good enough. Um, but, you know, there you go. Oh, if you lost, that's OK. I mean, not, not winning is OK. Not fighting isn't. So. Well, that's right. Um, but what, uh, what, I, what I think is interesting, I mean, uh, uh, the other thing that we, we haven't mentioned into, into or added into the mix of this is, of course, the fact that uh, the newspaper industries uh, are, are in decline, and um, what I'm sort of sensing is that the resources aren't there anymore to send the the journalists out into the field and to and to report properly. Um, what I think we all need to be asking <coughs> ourselves is where do we go from here? And I think you are taking the the, the best step forward and. The important thing is that this, these films that you're making um, get used or, or get, into, get, get, get into the public arena in different ways. And I think you know, the more you investigate innovative ways of getting these multimedia shows out there, that's the way you're going to get your public. We've got a limited time, and I want to bring in the other people. Are there any other questions in the room? <coughs> Don't be shy. They're down in this corner here. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Reem. Um, I just had a question on, you know, whether I mean, obviously, I'm not questioning the, the you know, necessity of trying to show pictures like that. But I was just wondering whether, um, in a way, exposing the public to, you know, sort of pictures which are more difficult and 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 in a way, you know, um, controversial can also on the longer term uh, have the effect that uh, you know the they become the reaction the reaction will be saying? one of you know lesser sh you yeah know, they won't be as the shock diminishes over a period yeah of time. and i'm thinking of you know i come from lebanon and you know this is obviously the palestinian israeli conflict is very present um uh and uh, you know certain arab medias do tend to show pictures of you know palestinian kids which are you know, horrific. You know, and and I think that on the longer term, perhaps it it 
you know, it had the effect, right. So you come from that sort of background where you see it all in, in, in the press there, you see very little of any of that here. I mean, yes. what's it, so what's your impression of the job that the media is doing here? Do you think it's more effective uh, not to show these graphic images, not to show what we actually think war is really about? Do you, do you feel that? Uh, I, I mean, uh, I think maybe you should ask the question, what's right? Rather than what's effective, and uh, you know, it's it's a difficult. Um I think it's also not a question of just showing the most graphic images, because it's actually you know the reality of of warfare is that the vast majority of it is incredibly mundane and banal and you know mediocre and pointless and stupid, and not just this kind of scary romantic um, action picture that. Uh, that we see a lot, and usually what we see is a, a kind of very sanitized action picture, something that is essentially a reference to a movie that a photographer saw when they were a kid. You know, it's, we see a lot of pictures of guys with guns, and I don't think that really tells us very much about the conduct of war or what works, what doesn't work, what's effective or ineffective. So, but, you know, and I think to go, Back to your question, you know, you hear this, we spoke about this earlier, this idea that if you show these graphic pictures, people will become desensitized to them. Well, you know, try it, see what happens, and let's go from there, you know, but start with being honest. Any other questions? This gentleman here, can we just pass that forward? Thank you. Hi, my name's Martin. Have you figured out a way to get paid for putting images on the internet? If you can't, get the magazines to, to pay you. Um. I was really lucky because I, I really tried hard. I was I was working for a daily newspaper, and and I think I was when when I left and when I became a freelance photographer in 2003, I tried my best to to be assigned to do what I love to do, and I was I feel really lucky that I was all the time refused, and I was never really got paid um, and assigned for for these for these jobs, and I think that actually gave me the opportunity to be totally independent and totally honest because there were no strings attached. Um, I'm, I'm working and doing corporate jobs that pays uh, luckily much better than, than, the, uh, than the media tends to pay and then I use that money to go and, and report and do what I think the, the media should do or us journalists or photographers should do. And in that way, yes, I get paid for what I'm doing, whether directly or not, that's a different question. I think one of the interesting things you're seeing now with new media is seeing the most powerful, well-funded, most established, entrenched <coughs> media institutions being decimated by people who have no resources, you know, these bedroom bloggers who, for all intents and purposes, have, should have no impact, but are having a phenomenal impact. And the the initial reaction of the mainstream media was basically to say, you know, these people aren't credible. They're not. They don't have training. They don't have uh, money. They don't have an economic interest in what they're doing. And I think they wrote them off as, you know, basically saying these people are stupid. And the, if the public buys into it, it's because the public is stupid. I think what's actually happened and what um, people in the institutions of media are going to have to wrap their heads around is that not only does a lot of the public think that these, these totally unprofessional uh, blogger, not journalists, they don't just think that their work is as good, they actually they trust it more because it doesn't have an economic interest. It doesn't have a financial agenda. So I don't know if that's a good answer to your question, but I think it's another way of looking at it. OK, so you just pass that one back. <clears throat> that kind of goes on to my question, actually. The, um, does it really matter that the newspapers are no longer publishing photo essays in the traditional sense? Because, as Susan mentioned, they're, they're on a diamond spiral anyway, and the internet has enabled the likes of you to get your message to everybody else um, without having the advertisers manipulating what's on the page. I think that's very true, and uh, I think what, what we all have to find out now, how to you know, not just how to how to put the images and how to put our messages out there, but how to how to make it available for the public, and how you know, just 
just have the public to find the content because I think that's that's going to be the next challenge of us. But but publishing it, no, I don't think it's it matters whether it's uh, whether it's traditional publication or non-traditional. I think it matters to the extent that it's a lost opportunity if the the people who have the most experience and the most training and have devoted in some cases decades to this if they just check out and hand it over to this kind of maelstrom of people who are totally winging it, like us. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a lost opportunity. I, I, I don't think, the you know, to use crude terms, the mainstream media should pit themselves against the new media. I think they should think and become very active in terms of trying to help the new media develop, not trying to compete against it or trying to, to, to squash it. To be fair, there are publications and there are, there are editors who are trying their best. Uh, but unfortunately, that's, you know, most of the cases is just failed attempts. Question here. <clears throat> yeah, I was wondering if you think there are any particular parts of the world or countries that are still doing a better job in the, uh, if you want to call it mainstream media, um, or is this a completely uh, global phenomena that, that we're going through? I don't know personally. I mean, I, I was reading a, you know, what it seemed to me an interesting fact the other day that Iran has the highest uh, per capita number of bloggers in the world. And that may be uh, a powerful, powerful force for them. You know, if, they, if, if their media is state controlled, if they, don't, if they don't have what we would consider a traditional uh, journalistic structure, then those, those bloggers uh, may be the next best alternative. So. I think I was reading some, uh, a few weeks ago that possibly in Turkey, uh, newspaper sales are higher than ever. I, I don't know why particularly there, but uh, I'm just wondering if there are certain um, cultural reasons why some areas might s still be much more supportive of, uh, of traditional media. But I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, as I said earlier, you know, I'm kind of checking out of this for a year. I'm doing a fellowship in, at a university in the United States, and basically, I'm just going to spend a year looking, researching this. And because fundamentally, I don't think the best thing I can do is make more pictures that don't go anywhere. You know, when we need to tackle uh, a bigger problem, which is what happens to the pictures and what happens to to our our knowledge, our experience. Any more? Can we work our way back with this gentleman over here on the left? <coughs> Hi there. Um, I'd just like to comment, sort of following on from what this gentleman in front said um, about these pictures and similar sort of material going to new media. Um, and that's all very well, and it's, it's great if you're interested, but you have to hunt this stuff out. Um, and unfortunately, I think a large percentage of the population um, miss out on uh, the reality of what is going on, because unless you're hungry to find it, you're not going to see it. Um, I think uh, it was a few years ago when the tsunami struck, um, and I was in France, and I was quite shocked by how graphic the coverage was on TV there. Um, that I first realised how censored the, the British um, press and, and TV and news is. Um, <clears throat> and I don't think... I don't think a lot of people realise that. I don't think the average um, public realise that they're not seeing the full story with a lot of these things. Um, and, and just as a sort of a quick question, I, I just wonder, um, with regards uh, to the tsunami and the, the French media being much more graphic, um, do you think that's a cultural thing? Or with what is going on now, <coughs> um, is it across the board? Is it much more of a political um, subject, which is hence why we're not seeing these kinds of images, whereas the tsunami was obviously a much more of a, a world um, catastrophe.
catastrophe, if you like, and there was no real sort of political agenda or, or, or face to keep up there. I think the tsunami was, in literal terms, a kind of perfect storm in media, from a media perspective, in that, you know, it happened the day after Christmas. It happened in a place where that was, you know, starting in Thailand, at least, where it was accessible to the global media. And you also, you happen to have, you know, thousands of Europeans die in it. If, if, there, if you hadn't had thousands of, I, th I think there's a phenomenal number of uh, Swedish p tourists who were washed off the beaches, if they hadn't died, if it was just Indonesians and Thai people and you know, people in Sri Lanka, I don't think this, uh, the tsunami would have been such a major story. Uh, but a number of factors triangulated in, in, in a particular way that did make that a huge story and that had ramifications across the board. You know, there, I remember a year later, at the, or at the end of the same year, in, um, in, uh, sorry, in, in, in Pakistan, when there was an earthquake there, I was in a refugee camp with the, I think with an MSF field team, and I was asking them how it was going with their, with their relief efforts and how it was going with their fundraising. And the guy said, we made so much money during the tsunami, we don't, we're still burning that money off. You know, we don't even need to worry about collecting money for this one. I think, you know. One, one, one point, as somebody who's worked in television news uh, until not so fairly recently for a long time, I will say, perhaps one of the questions is about us, too. I've been in a television newsroom when a, 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 a gra graphic image slipped through and the f switchboards just lit up uh, with people ringing up to complain, to say, you've made my child cry. Um, you know, I want you to come here. You're responsible for that. How dare you do that? And you know, I've seen a situation where producers and editors are very sensitive to that, and they hear those voices. What you don't hear so much of is the people who are ringing up and saying, thank you for showing us that, because now we really see what's actually going on. It's one of the dilemmas that editors and producers have in some cases. Any more questions? Gentleman at the back. <clears throat> Uh, evening, I'm Edmund Tarakopian. Firstly, just like to congratulate both of you on very, very powerful um, pieces of work. Um, my question's a little bit technical and probably boring to everyone, but it's exploring this whole new multimedia thing of sound recording and stills and sort of marrying them together. Now, obviously, as photographers, you know, we know what we're doing, we know the whole ethics, and we would never. Well, if you're a decent photojournalist, you'd never set anything up. You'd never photograph an untruth, etc. But with sound, how are you approaching that? Because obviously, you can't do both things at the same time, or certainly, you can't do both things at the same time well. So, for example, like you know, at the beginning when you had machine gun fire and the soldiers, I'm presuming maybe the recording wasn't exactly at the same time, and it was taken at a different time, and marrying the two up. And the only reason I'm asking is I'm exploring this myself, so I'm not making a point. Or anything, but what's your approach to that? Is it do you see it as being okay to sh to sort of maybe mix gunfire from a different battle or later on that afternoon with with a with an image which was taken at a different time? Yeah, actually, the um, the way I work is that I do both things simultaneously, and um, you know, having said that, and I'm a photographer, so that's my prime focus, but. You know, in many of these occasions, you just you just set the uh, the recorder and put it on the ground. Most of the times, you are just ducking and behind a tree, or when you're running, you just pick it up and don't care about that voice. But you know, um, editing the voice is is obviously a question, um, and that's probably a second part. Of it. Uh, but I think that's just you know, if you're talking about images, just editing images and sequencing them, you're not really questioning whether that was a real sequence, whether when, when you have a story and you would, you would like to uh, publish it, let's say, in, a, in an exhibition, you know, you don't really care whether, you know, the first image really happened in the first place. So I think there is always a way to get around that, and there is always a way to be dishonest with everything, with images, with sound, with the mix of them. But I think um, um, probably, you know, if you if you try to be honest with what you are doing, whether it's pictures or sound, you know, you're gonna end up with an honest report. Yeah. 
It's, it's sort of interesting. When you and I met, first of all, in Afghanistan, you were just using a, a very straightforward camera, a Leica film camera with a black and white film in it. And, and even though at that time digital had started to come in, you were you, you're quite keen on just using that very simple tool. And you, you're, you're traveling a long way now into the point where you're getting into multimedia. Actually, that was the point when everything started to change. Uh, as a newspaper photographer, I started to photograph in digital in 97, and the war was 2001. And the newspaper I was sending was pretty poor. And uh, they said, like, I, I can send you there for a week, but I cannot provide you anything that you can transmit with. So I said, OK, can I just work uh, on film? And they said, yeah, it's fine. It doesn't matter. And that was the time when all the conventional magazine photographers who used to work with slides and, uh, and definitely film. Uh, started to use digital cameras in a, uh, because you know media started to change and you know deadlines were on a daily basis even for magazine photographers. But I think you know eventually equipment does not matter. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you work with digital or whether you work with film. You know there are advantages and disadvantages on both ends. I think the uh, the picture of what matters at the end. Okay. Any more questions? All right, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Balash and Taro, thank you very much. you um, given us a lot of food for thought tonight, and uh, thank you very much indeed for coming to the front line tonight. Thank you, Tim, and thank you for coming. <laughs>